Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Housing prices and rents keep rising faster than historic norms. We've now got the highest inflation of this entire era, but your property's operating expenses are up too. I've got a solution for that. Then, do we have a disagreement here? I see today's housing market as strong and healthy. It sounds like today's guest could differ. Let's break it down right here. This should make for a most interesting conversation today on Get Rich Education. Knowing the difference between a turnkey provider and a vertically integrated rental property company can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars over the life of your investment. Some companies sell you a property they don't own, renovate it with contractors they don't control, refer you to a property management company they don't manage, all in multiple markets because they can't source enough inventory. That's why truly passive investors work with our friends at JWB Real Estate Capital, perhaps the country's only vertically integrated rental property investment company. They operate in one market, Jacksonville, Florida, and their whole job is to make investing in rental properties easy for you. In fact, because of their vertically integrated approach, their clients have gained 79% more home price appreciation than the overall Jacksonville market since 2013. Find out more about why it pays to invest with JWB. Call them at 904-677-6777 or go to jwbrealestate.com slash GRE. GRE listeners can't stop talking about their service from Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They've provided our tribe with more loans than anyone. They're truly a top lender for beginners and veterans. It's where I go to get my own loans for single-family rental property up to fourplexes. So start your pre-qualification and you can chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. They'll even deliver your custom plan for growing your real estate portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich education. Welcome to GRE, reaching 188 nations worldwide, and importantly, reaching you. I'm Keith Weinhold. Why live a small life and struggle to get debt-free while in inflationary times now you profit from debt and you're living the life you always hoped you would. That's what we're doing here. Not living below your means, but growing your means. Oh, but we didn't do the place names today. So from Glastonbury, England to Glastonbury, Connecticut, and across 188 nations worldwide, this is Get Rich Education. Hey, I'm under no obligation to do the place names every week. A part of your education that I've discussed quite a bit in the past year is how higher mortgage interest rates typically mean that higher home prices are coming, which is the opposite of what everyone expects. Yep, that's now happened seven out of seven times since 1994. I'm not going to explain it all again. You can listen to other recent shows, but higher mortgage rates are a confirmation that we have a strong economy and or high inflation, a tight job market, and a person that feels secure in their job That is what makes someone want to put roots down and buy a home, regardless of what mortgage rates are. And the other thing that happens in this higher mortgage rate environment, they've risen for the last year and a half now, is that when rates rise, builders slow down on building. Now, whether or not home builders should do that is another question, but some of them think that with higher rates, not as many people will be able to afford the homes. Hence, crimping the demand. And by the way, you can see this reflected in the measure of home builder sentiment. You might have seen those indices before. Well, home builder sentiment has been down lately. All right, well, what happens when higher rates make builders stop building? Yep, you guessed it. Housing doesn't get built and supply stays low. And that is just another reason that higher rates correlate with higher home prices. The last CPI inflation figure came in hotter than July at 9.1% from a year ago. Gasoline, airfare, and food inflation, they're all persistently high. 
Yeah, what about those food prices? I mean, my goodness, by now, does your grocery store have a loan officer in the meat department or what? Is there real demand for beef ground chuck mortgages? Is that how expensive meat is these days? But would any bank want to hold rump roast loan debt on their balance sheet? I really don't think so. Now, that doesn't sound like something that I would want to invest in personally. But seriously, here, the annualized inflation rate, which is one month change multiplied by 12, that's an eye-popping 17%. Last month, a record share of Americans said that inflation is their number one financial concern. And you know, everyone in charge is playing the inflation blame game. What about the actual person of one Joseph Robinette Biden Jr.? What does he say? (laughs) Biden points to inflation coming from external forces like the big sickness that's been going around since 2020 and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And then on the other hand, Biden's foes, they blame it on stimulus checks and trillion dollar spending programs and paying people to stay at home. Everyone is playing the blame game. Then you have a group of these other people that say, oh, no, this is the Fed's fault. They're the ones that misread the situation. They're the ones that called inflation transitory. They're the ones that should have hiked rates sooner. Well, despite whose fault it is, jobs numbers have been coming in higher than expected. And okay, sure, that's good for you to know that your tenant is employed and continued good jobs numbers, they actually make a recession somewhat less likely. But good jobs numbers, they are also inflationary themselves. Real average hourly earnings, that's wages adjusted for inflation, they're declining at their fastest pace in 40 years. So really, therefore, let's talk about you and your situation. The more of a percentage of your income that comes from your job rather than other sources, the worse off you are. The more real estate you own and the more yield you have there, the better off you are. So inflation causes some real economic aberrations. Just imagine this. Imagine if your home's electric bill was higher than your mortgage payment. Can you imagine that? Does that sound ridiculous? Well, look, that's what can happen if high inflation hangs around year after year. Your mortgage payment does not adjust with inflation, and in a sense, that makes it an asset for you. Operating expenses, though, like property tax and property insurance costs, they're rising. You know, the insurance costs on just a few of my single-family rentals are up more than 40% since last year. Not a typical situation, but I'm seeing that happen in some places. Then you've got property appreciation, and that just keeps pushing skyward farther than the James Webb Space Telescope, okay? Hey, that's great. But you know, property appreciation, that does not help you pay these rising monthly operating costs, like property tax and property insurance. Well, what does pay them? Rents and rents are scorching hot as well. Surging rents, that more than covers rising operating expenses like taxes and insurance. Why is that? Well, that's simply because rent is just a higher absolute number. Yes, we're talking about the cash flow enhancement crown of the term that I coined the inflation triple crown because real estate investors benefit from inflation three ways at the same time. Now, one problem out there, and you might be running into this, is that property managers, you know, unless you ask them, unless you get on them, oftentimes they don't raise the rent aggressively enough. You've got to ask them about that. I just ask my property managers to raise the rent. And in cases where my insurance premiums have gone up substantially, like I just shared with you, I told my property manager the real numbers in the insurance premium increase to justify why I need this raise, to make it concrete so that they get it for me. And over time, I've noticed that apartment building owners that tend to be these bigger institutions, you know, they're often better about making healthy rent increases than single family rental owners are. So my message to you is to raise the rent and you deserve to raise the rent. So not only are you adjusting it to the market amount, Consider how you took the time to learn from this show and give yourself credit that you took some risks to get to where you are today. You embraced at least some element of contrarianism. Perhaps you diligently built your credit. 
You educated yourself on real estate. You accumulated a 20% down payment for a rental property when you could have blown that money on anything. Then you took on an 80% loan. You persevered through the sickness uncertainty. Yes, I use the term sickness about what beset the world in 2020 so that I don't get banned from any platforms. So look, you took on all of that to provide good housing to someone else. So you've got every reason to raise the rent. And when you own real estate for yield, this high inflation is a boon. That is a positive to you. Bloomberg just reported that rents are increasing at their fastest rate since 1986. And I think they're going to keep increasing unbroken for quite a while. Now I've got to tell you, you are really setting yourself apart. Most people think that the only way to generate more income is to trade their time for it. When you raise the rent, you increase your income, and it was done largely passively. I think that Chris Crone said something well recently. Let's say that you're an automotive mechanic and you are making $60 an hour, and you went to school and you learned how to be an auto mechanic. Now, don't get me wrong. I am truly grateful for an auto mechanic. Sheesh, offhand right now, when I'm in my car, I couldn't even tell you where I'm supposed to reach to pop my hood, okay? But if the auto mechanic making $60 an hour, look, if he stays on that path, where does that lead him or her? Let's say it's him in this case. Well, you've probably got a stable job there. I guess if over the years your own car breaks down, you might be able to fix it yourself and that can save you a few thousand dollars. That's a benefit, I suppose. But look, where is that person going to be 10 years from now if they stay in this lane? What would they be then? A mechanic earning $90 an hour? Where's the growth in that? Did that even keep up with inflation, first of all? But where did you open up the time to live the life that you really want to live inside that? What can happen over that time, too? I mean, people become less fulfilled. People become more resentful as they see a few others living the life that they only wish that they could relationships dissolve, your body breaks down, you're never really challenged. But people just never get out of that lane because they learned that that's good enough and that's all you should expect and you ought to be grateful for that. Well, I say you can be grateful for what you've got and still start moving into an expansionary lane at the same time. So you need something that produces income while you're not actively involved with it. And that's what owning property for yield can give you. And that's what you can find at GRE Marketplace. I'm sorry that that website has been unusually slow recently. We learned that it needed an upgrade. So now it opens up in a respectable speed. So to get connected with income property providers across the nation, just create one login, one time, it's free, and get access to all property providers in one place at GREMarketplace.com. Let's talk to this week's guest straight ahead in a couple minutes here. Since she was last with us a few years ago, a lot has changed in the housing market. I see the housing market as healthy and strong. She says that it's unhealthy, and I guess it depends on how you look at it, but this might turn from a housing update panel into a debate. I don't know, but I'm going to let her talk in this interview to get her point of view, especially if it differs from mine. Hey, as they say... Disagreement is just the start of a great conversation. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is GRE. You can get a 50-year-old house somewhere or buy a new one directly from the builder with tenant resilient amenities already built in. With over 3,000 Florida units at different construction stages, they are exclusively for investors. President Wagner and Alaska and team also invest strongly in their own product. That's belief. Start at buildtorentdirect.com. That's build the number two rentdirect.com or text 407 927 5074. Hey, my friend Damian Lupo informed me the checkbook IRAs have been made illegal by the U.S. tax court. If you have a checkbook IRA, your holdings are now disqualified with taxes and penalties up to 50%. But don't panic, Damien and the EQRP company can fix this. Those IRAs can be converted into EQRPs retroactive to last year, getting those tax deductions and reducing your taxable income. In this way, you can invest your 401k or IRA in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, and even your own business 
So whether you're a full-time investor or retired or even a dentist with dozens of employees, if you're listening, you qualify, the EQRP works. It's a solution. You'll control your money, kill UBIT, and pay way less taxes. To learn more about this strategy and free up your retirement money, get the newest EQRP special report. Text GRE to 307-213-3475. That's text GRE to 307-213-3475. This is Rich Dad Sales Advisor Blair Singer. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. And above all, don't quit your daydream. Much like me, today's guest helps others build passive income and ongoing cash flow with real estate so that you can live a life on your own terms. And she does that through her network called Real Wealth. She's the past president of American Women in radio and television. And, you know, she just had a great all around long time media presence. She's a frequent guest expert on CNN, CNBC, Fox News, NPR. And it's been a few years since she's joined us here on GRE. So it's a pleasure to welcome back Kathy Fecky. Oh, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Yeah, we want to have a housing market update, Chad. And there are always so many variables in the housing market. And it seems like some of them are at extremes today. I think to really bring one up to date on what's happened in the past year, I would look at something that sounds ominous. And with higher prices and higher interest rates, we know that year over year, median monthly mortgage payments are up 56%. And although that sounds ominous, I actually think the housing market is really healthy and there are a lot of supportive measures there, Kathy. But tell us from your perspective, what are your thoughts with today's housing climate? I would argue that it's not that healthy of a market in the sense of affordability. The Federal Reserve kept rates. Well, basically, the Federal Reserve, I think a lot of people are learning more about the Fed these days than ever. Right. Uh, but the Fed is an organization that controls the economy by raising the overnight lending rates or reducing them. If we're at a, a difficult time in the economy, like we were in COVID with 22 million jobs that were lost in just a matter of weeks because people couldn't go to work, well, the Fed came in to stimulate the economy during that very difficult time. The problem is they did it for too long. And what I mean is they were buying mortgage-backed securities until just this year and in addition to keeping the overnight lending rate at zero so that banks could borrow from each other at zero. So that was needed in 2020. But we saw in 21 that the world was recovering pretty quickly. Certainly the U.S. housing was already going gangbusters last year. So it didn't need that support. It didn't need that kind of stimulus. So the bottom line is the Fed has admitted now that they overshot and they stimulated for too long. And that drove prices up because Really, it became so much cheaper to own a home when you've got 2% interest rates, you know, mortgage rates. So when more people can buy, that drives prices up. And the only tool that they know how to slow that down is to raise rates again. Here we are now in this conundrum of high home prices from low rates. To slow it, they have to raise rates and housing is expensive. So it's not healthy. It's a sad thing to me for first-time home buyers. And those first-time home buyers are the largest group uh, or generation ever of first-time home buyers hitting this market where affordability is just not there. And on top of it, supply is just not there. There's not much to choose from. Now there's bidding wars on rental property. So I would argue it's an unhealthy market, but not the way that you're seeing it in the news or the headline or your friends on Facebook or whatever. The way I see it as unhealthy is different than maybe what other people are saying when they say there's going to be a market crash. Right. Yeah. We should talk more about what I'm talking about when I think there's a lot of support for the housing market. I agree with you about those wannabe first-time home buyers. Yeah, this market is worse for them. They're the ones teeter-tottering on the brink of affordability and higher prices and higher mortgage rates have certainly knocked them out of that. I like to often look at things through the lens of supply and demand for those existing homeowners, maybe for those able to buy rental property. There could be a lot of support there when one looks at supply and demand. It's one of the first places I look. So what do you see through the supply and demand spectrum, Kathy? Every market is different, and that's really important. You know, We often talk about housing markets, but you and I both know that every market is different. 
There are going to be markets that are oversupplied, not that many though, and a lot of markets that are undersupplied. And it just depends on what's happening in that area. Is there job growth? Has there been a lot of builders in the area bringing on new supply? Is there population growth? Have prices gone up so much that people are going, you know what, I can't live here. I'm going to go somewhere else. So every market is different. This is my prediction is that certain markets that really got a big boom over the last couple of years, you can probably name those markets. We know Boise, Idaho, what prices went up 40% in one year or something. Boise, Phoenix, Austin, Nashville. Yeah. (laughs) Those markets. I don't really see uh, prices increasing much more in those markets, even though they're still extremely desirable for young people, for millennials, for these first time home buyers. It's just become so expensive. We've got markets that didn't really see a lot of new supply. They didn't have builders coming in because maybe they're just not that attractive of a market for a big builder. Those areas, I think there's still a lot of upside. I'm excited. And that's always been the markets that I've been interested in is the kind of off the radar ones. Because the big builders, they're going to go to the Atlantas and the Dallases of the world. That's where they're going to make their money. But when you go to, say, for example, a little market like Cincinnati, Ohio, I, we've seen prices go up there quite a lot, but it's still so affordable right. compared to other areas. We have now six syndications that we've done where we're building homes. And one of the markets we chose without really knowing, this is pre-COVID, so we had no idea how it would pop, but Bozeman, Montana. That's another market where there's tremendous demand because now more people can live anywhere. It's tremendous demand to live there, but there are really no other builders. We just kind of got lucky, got in there. There's no national builders. So not a lot of new supply and yet a lot of new people moving there, especially thanks to, you know, the Yellowstone, the show. I don't know if you watch it, but people watch Yellowstone. They're like, oh, I want to go live there. It's a great show. (laughs) It's been good for the uh, local realtors there. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Well, we think about housing at its most fundamental level. We're talking about housing people, and that begins with demand. And we are in this demographic patch where 28 to 34-year-olds are the most populous cohort in all of America. And why that's important is these are people of prime household formation years. So when one wonders where does this demand keep coming from and what's going to push demand in the future, oftentimes it comes back to that 28 to 34-year-old cohort. That's exactly it. We've got this huge group of millennials that are forming families. And and there was really a lot of misinformation over the past 10 years that supposedly millennials weren't going to be like, weren't going to behave like other generations and somehow wanted to live downtown all their life and be single. We're talking about a very big generation. If we're looking at, you know, people in their twenties all the way to their almost forties now, you just can't compare a 40 year old with a 25 year old. They're definitely at different life cycles. But 10 years ago, when there was all this talk about millennials being slow to the game, they were in their twenties, you know, like who's buying houses and forming families at that age. It just, they weren't ready yet, but they are now because builders haven't built enough to keep up with them. And there was just a misunderstanding of this generation. Here we sit with no housing for them, whether it be rental or to buy. And it is really sad. I've been trying to tell as many people as possible, especially when interest rates were low, like lock it in. But right now there's bidding wars on rental property. So If you own, if you're in a position to be able to buy property today and rent it out, you're really doing a great service to these people trying to have roof over their head, especially if you can find property that's generally affordable for the area. You're doing a great service because maybe the people who want to live there can't buy it themselves at this time, maybe when rates go down, but not right now. But if you can, then you're able to maybe not cash flow as much as as you could last year when rates were lower. You can still cash flow. And then in a year or two, lower your rate again, refi into lower rates. I'm pretty sure we're going to see that again. Then you've done a great service to the young people of the world today. Yeah, two 34-year-olds that live above a gym downtown and have two kids probably aren't going to be living there very long. They want to get out into oftentimes a single family home and spread out. 
Yeah, from the humanitarian perspective, it's not a great housing market. I mean, if we don't have adequate housing for people, it's really unusual. It's really unfortunate. We put a man on the moon in 1969, but we cannot adequately house people in the 2020s. But from an investor perspective, for things that support prices, this is what I mean. It is a healthy market from that perspective. We talked about where the high demand is coming from. And then we look at supply. We look at a metric like the FRED active listing count, where oftentimes there are about one and a half million units seen as that kind of supply demand balance. And we have only about 600,000 units available now. So therefore, we're down about 60% in supply just from 2016. So high demand coupled with that low supply. And these are two conditions that aren't very malleable. They're pretty rigid. You can't change demographics that quickly. And we can't bring enough supply online very quickly. They're in elastic conditions. So this is what I mean when I talk about a healthy housing market being supported from a supply demand perspective. People talking about a housing crash, either they're just really hopeful that they can get foreclosures right, for cheap. Right. You know, I mean, I don't know yeah. why people are coming out with that, but you have to ask yourself, if you owned a house that you bought last year or the year before, or let's say 10 years ago, and you locked in a two or 3% mortgage. And now you've got, what is it? 20 something. I don't even know, but an enormous amount of equity, a record amount of equity in these homes because prices have gone up. People are sitting on a low payment with a ton of equity. And why just because days on market have increased or there's, you know, sales have dropped. You're suddenly going to go, ah, I got to sell my home with this really cheap mortgage. <laughs> Nobody's doing that. If anything, the fact that mortgages were low for so long, people are going to hold their homes because why would they sell and pay more and have a higher mortgage? Right. That's, that's going to affect supply as well. The idea that there's going to be some kind of housing crash, people are just not looking at the fundamentals. It's very clear that Today's current homeowners are in the best position they've ever been in with the lowest rate. Basically, the payment that they're paying is the lowest percentage of their income that we've seen because, again, the payments are locked in and they're low. The idea that somebody loses their job and they're going to go, oh, no, I'm just going to have to turn my house into the bank and not collect all that equity. If you need to, you'll put it on the market and you'll sell it. <laughs> you know, it's there are people who are deeply affected today by the rising interest rates, homeowners. And that would be people who are, were expecting to flip a property maybe, and now are stuck because they're maybe in a hard money loan and they were planning on flipping. And now maybe the market's not there and they have to lower. So I'm definitely hearing that flippers are challenged today. Anytime you're in a short-term loan like that or needing to sell rapidly, then you could find yourself in trouble. But people who would just want a place to live, now maybe if somebody got a new job and they have to move to another area, they might decide maybe I should keep this home and just rent it out because there's so much rental demand, even if they've never been a landlord before. And then they might go rent somewhere else, you know, and keep that house because they're locked into that low rate. So this idea that there's a housing crash, no. Are prices going down? In some areas, they are. Because if you're looking at the data and saying, okay, the Fed right now is intentionally trying to reverse the mistake they made, and they're raising rates. They're making the cost of money more expensive. So yes, there's an opportunity right now to negotiate with sellers a little bit better than you could over the last few years. There was sure, like no you can actually ask for some inspection findings and not have to deal with all <laughs> cash offers for a change. Yes, yeah. as the housing market normalizes somewhat. It's coming back to a little bit closer to where it should be when people make as an important decision as buying a home. You should be able to inspect it. I can't believe that there were cities like San Francisco where you just buy it as is and the seller would put it up and say, if you're going to ask me any question, you don't get it. I'm taking the next person in the line who will just give me the money. That's not healthy. I'm so glad that the days on market is increasing and that now buyers can take a little bit more time. That's not everywhere. Some markets are still red hot, but in general, days on market, it's increasing. That's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. That means that maybe people who bought just this past year might see the house next door go for less than what they paid. That's possible. But that would probably just be the people who bought last year. And these people who just bought in this past year, they probably don't care. My daughter's one of them. 
she probably paid top dollar, but she's locked in to a rate that is lower than the rents. Yeah. So you know what? She didn't buy that house to live there for one year. She bought that house to raise her family and her son, who's in a great school district. So yeah, the people who bought this past year, they might kind of scratch their head and say, huh, shoot, the house next door to me is selling for less. Bummer. But you know what the difference is? the payments might be close to the same or the person who paid more might actually have a lower payment and be living cheaper than the person buying the cheaper house today. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you talk about the word crash. I think that's such a popular word in media headlines. That's the sort of thing that gets clicks. I don't see how any price crash is eminent, defining crash as a loss in price of 20% or more. But yeah, it's funny with some of these headlines, Kathy. I mean, I was talking about supply earlier. If supply in a balanced market is one and a half million homes and we fell to 500K, well, if we've gone from 500K of supply up to 600K of supply, that's a 20% supply increase. And you might see a headline out there that supply is up 20%. And that makes some people think that, oh my goodness, we're going to be overrun with a glut of homes. But no, overall, we need one and a half million just to get back into supply and demand equilibrium. So sometimes the sensational headlines need to be taken into perspective is what I'm talking about. But I heard you talk about dropping prices, something that I don't see happening in very many markets. Now, you're just talking about a few markets. Are you talking about a year over year price decrease in any US markets? It is starting to happen in places like Seattle, some areas that really saw massive price growth. They're starting to see a softening and price reductions. I would just chalk that up to aggressive sellers not understanding today's market and thinking they can still put up a sign on the yard and and sell at top price without doing a darn thing to the house and maybe not even clean it up. So we're going back to a time and not a balanced market yet, but at least a time where you have to try a little to sell your house. You have to make it look good and maybe do the landscaping and have all the marketing in place and so forth. And there's some agents and sellers who got a little lazy and don't think they need to do that and are having to reprice. Again, that's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. It's moving us back into a direction where things should be, where people can stop and think before they have to make the biggest purchase of their life. For your audience and and my audience, we want to probably know how this affects us as investors. Just look at some of the recent headlines, these multiple offers on rental properties. It's incredibly sad that even if you just want to rent a home, renters are probably the most challenged today because I believe the percent of their income that they're spending on housing has increased dramatically. Sure. And this is all the time when they have inflation increases and the cost of their gasoline and their insurance and their food and everything else. It's a really tough time for them. Yeah. So for people like us who are able to either provide new supply or go in and, and buy old houses and renovate them to be more rent ready, if you're able to provide some form of affordable housing, which is I know is what you and I both really focus on, yeah. that's, again, a great service for people who maybe don't want to have to move in with mom and dad, you know, and maybe mom and dad don't want their kids to move back in with them. Being able to find a way to provide housing is so important. I know that some groups are, are taking hotels and turning them into apartments, and now that's causing a problem with hotels where there's not enough overnight stays, which might be good for Airbnbs. It's just a very interesting time, and it's not going to last forever. It is probably the next four years, maybe six years of this rabid demand for housing. And then after that, it'll calm down. So there's this concern of, oh, well, let's not overbuild for that time, maybe six years from now, when now everybody has a home. But I don't see that as a problem because I'm in the building industry and we're having the hardest time getting anything finished. So I don't really see a threat of overbuilding either at this point. When it comes to pricing, sometimes a seller sees that, for example, in a market, housing values have been up 20% year over year. So they go ahead and put their property on the market and market up 20% over what it had sold for previously. And then they find they need to make a price cut and maybe come down 10%. Well, it will still sell for 10% more than what it did in the market last year. But yet that often gets reported as a price cut, sort of a difference there between a price cut and a year over year decline in prices. And so much of it comes down to that supply. We can look and see there's about 2.6 months, again, nationally, of housing supply right now. Historically, typically when we get up to four months of supply, we have something like four to five percent appreciation and we still have substantially less supply than that right now. 
I like how you bring up the fact that existing homeowners, they are in pretty good shape. 40% of homes don't have any mortgages on them at all. And then among those that do, the average loan to value ratio is 30%. So to your point, we don't have a distressed homeowner and they wouldn't have to walk away and create values to go down. They could just sell the property. So to give an example for a 30% loan to value ratio on a 500K home, that means a person would only have a 150K mortgage. So you do have existing homeowners in pretty good shape. Much of that is due to the fact that their mortgage was underwritten pretty conservatively for most people that are homeowners today. Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. You're going to have a housing crash when you have distressed homeowners. That is not what we have today. We did 10 years ago, for sure. But that's not the problem today. So whenever I see a post on Facebook, and I swear I just have to get off Facebook because it drives me crazy. <laughs> I know whenever I see prices are crashing and I'll just say, where? I'd love to know where. And then the crickets, I don't hear anything. So I understand there's fear out there. My advice to people is if you're going to read a headline, at least read the article because the headline is meant to scare you. It's meant to get your attention so they can sell ads to you. But when you go and read the actual content, it's not as scary. Like you'll see yeah. housing collapse, you know, and then you read a little bit. It's like, oh, sales are down. I see. The yeah, volume. that's not a housing right. collapse. It's just there's not inventory out there. You know, sales are down 20%. That's not the same as prices down 20%. But you have to read the fine print, right? Sure. A lot of readers don't realize oftentimes the article writer and the headline writer are two different people. And the headline writer mm -hmm. is there specifically to bring in clicks to yes. the article and the articles, what really gives the information. <laughs> but yeah, it. some people don't want to read. <laughs> yeah, please read the article. <laughs> yeah. Kathy, I know that you like to talk about what the Federal Reserve is doing and their moves, and they've made so many headlines recently. As we know, almost two weeks ago, inflation was reported at more than 9%, a high for this era. Currently, the federal funds rate is just below 2%. Two days from now, they have another meeting where a lot of people feel like it's going to be hiked up to something like 2.5%. The Fed, they're trying to fight a supply issue by sort of stomping out some of this demand. Talk to us some more about what you see the Fed doing in the future and how that can change interest rates from your perspective. Well, you know, it was my belief that we had hit the max on inflation. So I really thought we were going to see things slow down. And the inflation numbers are delayed. They're, you know, not the most recent numbers, but the Fed has to respond to it either way. They've already come out and said they're going aggressively after inflation and they want to bring it back down to the target of 2%. And the only way they know how to do that is to pull money back out of the system. Now they flooded. This is like a, a tsunami of money that came into the system and there's going to be damage from that. They flooded the market with money, increased the money supply by as much as 40%. I've heard even more than that, but right. that's what we've seen. So yes, of course, there's going to be a, an impact of that much money chasing goods. Prices go up, especially when the things that people want are limited. More people bid and there's more money to bid. Just like if you were playing Monopoly and we had a box of fake money and we're all playing, but there's 10 apartments or 20 homes on the board game. But then the banker says, oh, I'm going to just bring in another box of money, of this fake paper money, but we're not going to increase the number of houses on the game board. So now what do you have? You have more money, same amount of things to buy. People want it. They need it. Prices go up. Now, the only thing that the Fed knows how to do to correct this incredible error is to pull that money back out. And there will be consequences to that, sadly. There will be job losses. I mean, we're already seeing it with any industry that really boomed during the last two years, it may have to pare back now. And one great example of that is the mortgage industry. Mortgage companies are going bankrupt left and right and letting people off because who wants to refi at today's rates? You're going to see headlines like that. There are going to be industries where people lose their job because the demand just isn't there anymore. That's what the Fed is trying to kill, demand, and they're going to win. So as we see that happen and there's more layoffs, I know it sounds terrifying and awful, but this is a really good time to be laid off. Someone who gets laid off from a, a mortgage job, you can look at that headline and say, oh my gosh, thousands of people just lost their job. But you know what? 
There are so many jobs out there. There's two jobs for every person that wants them. What we need is people to want jobs. So, you know, if a company is going to lay off thousands of people, that's great because there's another company ready to hire those people. People getting laid off today are not walking into a 2009 market where there's no jobs for them. That's a very interesting way to look at it. It's never good to lose your job, but if you're ever going to lose it, now might not be a bad time as there are about two open job positions for every one person that's seeking work. And that plays into the Fed's dual mandate. Their dual mandate is high employment and stable prices. My conventional measures are doing pretty well with high employment, but they're not doing so well with stable prices. That's why we expect the rate hikes to continue. Kathy, why don't you wrap it up for us, especially through the perspective of someone that's looking to add income property to their portfolio today and just how that climate looks for them, given this heightened demand for rentals and so many people not being able to afford their first home. Well, I've been a contrarian all my real estate life, you know, just looking for what other people can't see. So personally, and I'll just whisper it here on the show so that nobody hears it. I just think this is one of the best opportunities ever because there's so much fear from these headlines that people unfortunately look at and listen to and believe there's more opportunity to get deals, to negotiate with builders, to get new homes, to serve this desperate demographic looking for housing by providing them rental property. I personally am going all in for the next six months because I think there's going to be more opportunity than I've seen in the last year. It was so hard to try to acquire any real estate over the past year because there was so much competition and people driving prices up. But now this is a great time to get in, even if the numbers don't make sense right now because of the high mortgage rates. If you're able to lock in a property at a price that makes sense, I truly believe that we're going to see rates go down again. When the Fed gets what it wants, which is to kill jobs and kill demand, then they're going to have to reverse again and lower rates. And a lot of people are saying that's going to happen next year or the year after that. There'll be a reversal and not to stimulate the economy again. So you can get the great price today and then just refi into a lower rate later. That's what we're looking at. And that's why a lot of people are doing arms to kind of make the numbers make sense today. I normally always get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. That's always my thing. I feel safe there. But right now I'm not worried about getting a 5-1 arm. You know, it's fixed for five years because I'm probably going to refi in a couple of years. Sure. I was having just that discussion on the show a few weeks ago. Sometimes 10 one arm rates are really pretty attractive. That means your rate stays fixed even on an arm for those first 10 years. Kathy, it's been great to get your insight on where you see the housing market. It sounded like we're going to disagree on a lot of things when you talked about an unhealthy housing market in the beginning, and I talked about a a healthy one, but we got into the nuance. I can see that we do see a lot of things similarly. It's been great having you here. Thanks so much for coming onto the show. Thanks for having me. Oh yeah, I always enjoy discussion with Kathy, a steady longtime voice in the industry. If you want to watch the video of our chat, you might like that, as I expect that it's going to show some figures, graphs, and charts while we talk in order to support our points. That YouTube channel name is, of course, Get Rich Education. Why are higher mortgage rates having such a hard time slowing down housing price appreciation? It's that inelasticity of both high demand and low supply, like I mentioned in the discussion there. And you know, one thing that you might not have thought about before with demographics is the housing turnover when there's a new home buyer. What does a 52-year-old homeowner do when they buy a new home? Well, they usually sell the one that they've moved out of. Well, what that really did is it just replaced one unit of housing supply with another unit. But with all these millennials that we have, what happens when a 29-year-old buys a home? Yeah, a lot of times that's their first home. So they didn't sell one in exchange for that new one. And now you have a better understanding of why this huge group of people in their late 20s and early 30s keeps soaking up that supply of available homes. And that is what keeps supporting prices. And that's why today, in inflationary times, I don't know of a better proven place to invest your dollar than leveraged property bought for rent yield. 
And yeah, we got into the details today. I guess my guest and I agreed on most things. She says it's good if you can still buy property and rent it out to someone else, much like I do. To give you an update, late last year, you'll recall that I released GRE's Home Price Appreciation Forecast for this year, both right here on the show and in our newsletter. At that time, seven, eight months ago, I stated that the expected national median home price should rise 9 to 10% this year. Well, we're now more than halfway through this year, and I don't see any reason to think differently than that. Hey, a lot of great shows coming up for you here in future weeks. I'm grateful for your listenership. Hey, go ahead and tell a friend about the show if you like what you learn about real estate here. And if you're a new listener, hit subscribe on your podcatcher and that way you'll get future weekly episodes delivered straight to you. I'm Keith Weinhold. I'll see you next week. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.